This evening we're talking about determination. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about determination that's probably beyond our comprehension. These are little school girls and they're going to school in uh, Karta 3 in Kabul, Afghanistan. As you can see, the girls are being searched for IEDs, improvised explosive devices. I was in Afghanistan in Kabul in April of this year and in the months just prior to that, there had been several uh, occasions where IEDs had been found on children that were going into the classroom. There were two or three that exploded uh, on children in classrooms. And thereafter, the, ch the children going to school were searched every day going into school. In this particular school where I was uh, visiting, there had been two IEDs found, but found before they exploded. So this is just another little peanut getting her, her legs padded down. So sometimes little ones like this um, might have a, an IED placed inside their school backpack and they, they enter school without knowing that they're carrying an IED. So because they have to go through this searching process and it takes a long time because there are 8,000 students that go to this school, they go to school in three shifts. Uh, there are about you know, 2,500 to 3,000 students per shift. And because they all have to be searched, you can see way down at the end of this end of the photograph, that's the searching uh, as they come in the gate. And so they come in uh, in a staggered way and then they stand very politely and very quietly in line for about half an hour while all two to 3,000 of them come in to be searched. That is determination for your education, that despite the hardships, despite the danger, these children are willing to continue to go to school to get their education. In this particular school, they have access to the Journey of Peace curriculum. And this curriculum was developed a number of years ago. Uh, actually, it began its development in 1998 with a group from the Center for Peace Studies at McMaster University. And this curriculum it has various components. One, the main component, is a series of 16 stories, and you're going to hear quite a lot about, more about that a little bit later and some puppets, and I think I will introduce you to a couple of the puppets. Uh, but one of the things that we discovered is that the teachers need to be trained in the, in the delivery of this curriculum like they do in all other curriculums. So part of what I do is, uh, what part of what I have done is to create a teacher's manual to, te uh, to teach the curriculum and also to go to Afghanistan to train master trainers who are selected teachers in so that they may train other teachers to deliver this cu curriculum. I'm particularly interested in the evaluation of this curriculum. Uh, currently, I'm not able to do that because I don't have the funds to do that. Generally speaking, this project has been voluntary. The last time that I went to Afghanistan, I was acting as a consultant. Uh, and I also have a website where these stories are available in PDF form, and they can be downloaded and used by anyone, anywhere. So our rationale is this. There have been about 30 years of uh, war and conflict in Afghanistan, but above and beyond that, there is so much hardship due to poverty and due to famine and due to the loss of the infrastructure, particularly in terms of health care and education. So the hardship that people in Afghanistan are determined to live through uh, is, is really, really pervasive. So the children are affected by, by war trauma, I, I've done some research and other people have done research. It's pretty clear that, uh, that war trauma is, is fairly ubiquitous throughout the child population and the adult population. Pretty much everyone is dealing with death and loss um, and most people have been dealing with displacement. This is, this is how we kind of thought about, or at least how I think about this, this curriculum. If we could create peaceful schools and peaceful families, we know that uh, corporal punishment in schools and in families is, is fairly common. And corporal punishment for children who are traumatized is, is, um, is not very helpful. So if we can create peaceful schools and peaceful families, uh, and in those schools and in those families, if we can model and teach compassion and empathy, then we can also use those skills to develop inclusion of others and acceptance of diversity, particularly ethnic diversity. And those skills will build the capacity for peace. And 
I think with all of those, those new capacities, then peace is a possibility. That's the rationale for this curriculum. So I'm going to tell you the story. And what I want you to do is I want you to see if you can pick out some of these uh, um, components of the stories, the sort of the hidden agenda. Uh, we have some empathic and compassionate relationships. We talk a lot about grief and trauma. Um, particular stories are dedicated toward the skills of reconciliation and conflict resolution. Those are specific uh, skills that are, are taught in stories. Uh, we deal with the ethnic diversity issue, understanding and accepting that people are different and that because they're different doesn't mean that they're bad uh, or scary or dangerous. Uh, we also look at occupational rehabilitation due to the loss and trauma of war, particularly around landmine ma maiming. And finally, we look at rebuilding the community. So this is Jamila. Uh, Jamila is about 10. She lives in the rural part of Afghanistan, and that's her very mischievous little brother, Ahmed. Jamila is looking after her garden because she can't go to school. Ahmed goes to school. This is Abdullah. He's Jamila and Ahmed's older brother. He's about 15, and you know, Abdullah's not a happy guy right now because about three months ago, there was a landmine in the field, and the landmine killed Abdullah's close friend and uncle, Uncle Yunus. Also injured in that landmine incident was the children's father, Mirza, and Mirza lost the lower part of his leg. So Abdullah used to go to school, but now he has to stay home and support his family and do all of the physical labor that his uncle and his father used to do. When he went to school, he would come home and teach his lessons to Jamila, but she doesn't get her lessons anymore. And he used to play with his little brother, but he's too busy now with the work to play with his little brother. So there's a very, very special woman in this family, and this is Bibi Jean, the children's grandmother. Bibi Jean provides the role model for compassion and empathy and helping the children to understand how the events of their lives have changed the way people function and the way they interact in the family. So she helps the children to feel loved and understood. Bibi Jean is the role model of healing in the stories. And uh, one of the things that, 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 one of the outcomes of the teacher training is that the teachers say to me at the end of the training, now I can be Bibi Jean. And I know they've got it. This is Mirza. And uh, as you can see, Mirza has lost his, his lower limb. Mirza's often uh, in a lot of pain. He's quite He's quite uh, reactive at times. He can be quite angry. Sometimes he's yelling at his wife, the children's mother. Sometimes he is very sad. As Bibi Jean says, he has too much time and not enough work. So I think at this point, I might just introduce Bibi Jean and Jamila. We have the puppets that go along with the stories because originally, when we introduced these stories, there was a very, very high literacy rate. That's declining, thankfully. But we were concerned that even if you had a book, you might not be able to read it. So we really wanted a way to help people, uh, the, the children, remember the stories. So, and also to enact the stories. So we created puppets to go with the stories. So this is Bibi Jean. She's the grandmother. And this is Jamila. And Jamila is about 10 years old. Now, just, I'm just going to do a very short scene because I know this is a big room and I'm probably at the back, you can't see very well. So I'll just do a little tiny bit. And this is how a teacher would tell the story in the classroom, not in English, mind you. Um, so, so this is just, uh, uh, just a, a, little, a little bit out of story number three. Jamila, you know you were telling me a little while ago about your frightening nightmares and the landmine explosion? Sweetheart, I think there's something more bothering you. Bibi Jean, can you have daymares? Well, daymares, what do you mean, darling? Well, Bibi Jean, sometimes during the daytime, I get these sudden memories of what I saw in the landmine day. Sometimes it reminds me, and then all at once, it's as if I'm there all over again. It's horrible. Oh, darling, I know exactly what you mean. I didn't know this was happening to you. I'm glad that you told me. But one more thing, how does this connect with your father? Well, Bibi Jean, I love Daddy very much, but 
when I have to look at his leg, I, I can't stand it. It reminds me of that terrible, terrible day, and I just can't take him his tea. Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that you were having these feelings. Do come and sit on my lap, and I will tell you something. There are things that I learned from someone who was very old when I was very young. It didn't mean so much when I was young. But my, as my life flowed along, there were some very, very bad things that happened. And then I remembered what I had been taught. And now I want to teach these things to you. So this is how a teacher would tell the stories. She would have students enact the stories with the puppets, or she would act out the story with the puppets herself. They loved the puppets. We, we did a survey. and. Uh, we asked the students, did they like the stories? Yes, they liked the stories. Did they like them in color, or black and white? Well, yes, they loved the illustrations, and it didn't really matter if it was black and white. But could they please have lots of puppets? <laughs> and this is, remember, Uncle Eunice was killed by the landmine. This is his 19-year-old widow, and she is suffering tremendous grief from the loss of her husband. They had only been married a year. And so this is Bibi Jean talking with young Auntie Fatima about her grief and she is offering to share grief because Fatima lost her husband and Bibi Jean lost her son so that they can share their grief together. Well, not only are there landmines, but there's also aerial bombing. So one night the, the village is bombed, um, and aerial bombing would mean American aerial bombing. The village is bombed, and the family is up all night and they realize that they must leave. Otherwise, tomorrow they might not be alive. So they pack their precious goods, and they pack little Ahmed, who's been up all night and who is now sleepy on top of the donkey, and they start to prepare a journey away from home. That evening, they spend the night in the home of a friend of Mirza, but this family is from a different ethnic group, and the children, for the first time, meet people who speak a different language, eat different food, wear different clothing, and they learn from, from Bibijan that although these similarities exist, that the commonalities of being human are far greater. But on this long journey, now you realize I'm having to do a synopsis of 16 stories very quickly. <laughs> but on this long journey, Abdullah sees his little sister chatting to her shawl. And he says, what are you talking about? Have you gone crazy? And she, she says, no. And he says, did you bring that kitten? And he gets very angry, and he grabs the kitten out of her shawl, and he throws the kitten away in the bushes. Well, Jamila was absolutely heartbroken, and she was very mad at Abdullah, and she wouldn't talk to him for three days. So Bibi Jean said to, to, taught uh, Abdullah how to do a reconciliation with his sister and mend that relationship. In the displaced persons camp that they eventually arrived at, seven families were living in one classroom of a school that was being used for the IDP. And in that schoolroom, Abdullah got into, into a fist fight with another boy over space. It was very, very crowded. Bibi Jean and Mirza uh, approached the boys and helped them to understand how to do a conflict resolution, come up with some creative ideas to solve the problem so that it was, benefit, it was a benefit to all. While in the, uh, in the displaced persons camp, Abdullah has a dream about becoming a soldier. He, he's angry about uh, the loss of his uncle and the damage that the war has caused his family, the harm that the war has caused his family. And he dreams of becoming a soldier. And he's having a dream there about a, uh, about a marketplace that isn't full of fruits and vegetables. It's full of armaments and landmines and rifles and AK-47s and Kalashnikovs. But he meets a soldier who's very tall. He's the 10-foot soldier. And the 10-foot soldier says, is it not more honorable to grow grapes? If you plant landmines in the field that blow off the fingers of, your, of, your, of little girls, is it not more honorable to grow grapes? That he has done deeds that he would wish to forget, even though those are the same deeds for which he is known as a hero. But in the city, where the family finally ends up, there is the opportunity for changes in their life. Mirza, who can no longer be a farmer because he's lost his lower limb, learns to weave carpets and he can make a fairly decent living weaving, a car weaving carpets. And Abdullah, who realized that he was wrong to want to join the fighting forces, has become a landmine educator and D minor. And young Auntie, Auntie Fatima, remember her, the young widow? Well, she had been sneaking off through all this time and going to midwifery classes. 
So on the, on the journey home, after about a year in the city, uh, the mum of the family goes into early labor and Aunt young Auntie Fatima is able to safely deliver a new baby girl whose name is Fatima. And as the family approaches their home, they're quite worried about how they will find their home. Will it be totally destroyed? Will their goods that they've hidden in the home be lost? But they, they find that their village is pretty much as they left it. And as the story ends, Abdullah has gathered the youths of the village and the youths are, are working cooperatively to go from home to home and rebuild the homes one at a time as a, as a group. So this is a picture taken in uh, teacher training in uh, April of this year. These are two high school teachers selected by their principals to come to the training. Uh, lots of laughter, lots of tears. It's hard to imagine a sadder face. This is Gulsum. And Gulsum is holding a picture of an event that happened to her. This is one of the activities uh, that is designed for the children. So when I do a teacher training, I have them act as a teacher uh, for a story, and everybody else is their classroom. So they teach, and our students doing the activities. So this is. Uh, drawing a scary memory activity. It's early on in the stories, and you can see down in the far corner there, um, that's a, a member of the Taliban firing a um, Kalashnikov into that home. That's an American bomber dropping bombs onto her home. The home is on fire. There is a person there lying uh, mortally wounded. And you can see that also the trees and the, the, the sheep are, are destroyed. It's quite unusual to see in Kabul to see a, a, a tree. Uh, many of the healing drawings that they draw are birds and animals and water and trees because these things have been taken from them. So our next steps are to reprint the stories for use in the schools. We um, had, uh, UNICEF had agreed to print about uh, 40,000 sets of 16 stories, um, and that was 2003, 2004, 2005. Um, and in, during that time, while they're rebuilding Kabul, um, many, many difficulties, technical difficulties, electrical difficulties, and they lost um, our English formatted version, and the version that they created was unfortunately unusable. So we don't have books in printed form at this time. Uh, we need to create a microeconomy for women to, to make the puppets because we know that that's what the kids like the best. They love to have the puppets. Currently, uh, there is teacher training going on. Um, myself, I was there in April. I will be returning in February. I just found that out today. I'll be returning in February, funded by uh, War Child Holland. And that will be to train teachers in the district of Pagman, just outside of Kabul. We need to increase the number of peace education classes, and in order to do that, we need to train more trainers. So um, I'm hoping that sometime in the near future, I'll be able to return and train uh, more groups of master trainers so that they can go out and train more teachers. But we have to provide them with the curriculum to use. And the last thing that I really need to accomplish is I need to evaluate this curriculum. We need to know that it works in the way that we think it will work. Our anecdotal uh, responses so far is that it does even beyond our hopes and dreams. Apparently, after children have been through this curriculum, they go home, they make their own puppets, they write their own stories of their own life, and they, and they bring it back to school. So these are the faces of determination. And I hope that uh, we are able to continue with this work. I think it's important work. I think Canadians are wanting to do things differently in Afghanistan. I think this one, this one project is just one small way where we can do things differently, because we sure don't want to leave these kids alone with what they're what they're struggling with. Okay. Thank you very much.